And we are recording. So welcome everyone um, to the podcast. This is episode three. Joined by Eddie. No Chris Coleman this week, but we do have our special guest, Andrew. Andrew, it's a pleasure, man, to have you. Especially Philadelphia native. Um, you know, city brotherly love. Always good to represent. <laughs> yeah, good to be with you, Josh and Eddie. Uh, I'm a Philly native as of about, I guess, about five, six years ago. Moving here from Green Bay, Wisconsin. So it's a bit of a change. But I'm getting used to right, Philly. You know, Enjoy it. I guess, it, how's the weather comparison? <laughs> with winter, man, yeah. compared to being a Green Bay. You know, when people talk about cold back east, and I'm from Washington, D.C., so I'm an East Coast guy. I know this weather well. But when people talk about cold back here, I kind of smile because uh, there's Eastern cold and then there's Midwestern cold, and it's very different. I mean, the Midwest, the one thing about the weather there is you don't get these big snow dumps like you get back east. You know, what happened a couple weeks ago with the 20 inches and 35 inches in D.C., you don't get that uh, back in the Midwest, but you get that constant cold and that constant like two, three inches of snow a day. So that's different. Yeah, it's I. either way, the, the winters are too much. I mean, <laughs> in the East, and I, I don't, I've never experienced a, a Midwest winter, but the East itself is enough for me. Like I, I left, I avoided that last little blizzard they got little uh, blizzard they got here and went to Florida. And I was like, I'm just gonna hang here for a while until this passes. <laughs> You know, the funny thing is when I went to Green Bay for the interview, and I can talk about how I ended up there, but um, I looked at Ron Wolf, the general manager, Bob Harlan, the president, and I said, listen, don't take offense at this question, but do I actually have to move here uh, to do this job? You know, I figured maybe I could do it remotely. <laughs> and in today's world, probably good, but this was a long time ago. And they said, no offense, we get it. You know, and the weather is, turns a lot of people away. But uh, yeah, you got to move here. And I ended up doing that. So I think that's probably a good segue. So for a lot of listeners that are going to be listening for this episode or re-listening through when it'll be on the actual podcast app, um, let's give a little background on yourself for those who might have no idea who you are or your background and really give the listeners and viewers, you know, who is Andrew Brandt? Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky. Uh, I admit to a lot of good fortune because I've been able to sort of see sports, which has been a passion of mine since being very young, from a lot of different angles. And I'm now in this angle of media and academia, which I really enjoy. And it's only because I've had these other angles, which is 10 years on the management side and 10 years on the player side. And I can get to that. But Growing up in D.C., huge Washington Redskin fan, going to all the games with my dad and really became a passionate football fan. My sport of play rather than watching was football, but play was was really tennis and uh, played all the East Coast tennis tournaments, played a couple of national tournaments and went out to Stanford where I was not good enough to play on that team. You know, they, they kept about 50 guys on the team so people like me could say, hey, I played for Stanford. Well, we really didn't. You know, we. <laughs> They had teams that played against Cal and USC, and then they had teams that put, the B team played against like Oregon and Arizona, the C team. Again, I was like on the G team, and I played against uh, <laughs> Reno, Humboldt State, you know, and anyway. But it was a point where I thought, hey, this could be a chance to try to do something with this. So me and a couple guys on the end of the bench started trying to play pro. And at that time, it meant these satellite circuits – I was playing in Colleen, Texas, and Lake Charles, Louisiana, and Panama City, Florida. Maybe three people would show up. You, you know, it'd start on a Monday. I'd lose by Tuesday usually, and then off to the next site. I Listen, I did this for about six months, and I got as high as maybe 2,600 in the world. And I realized I better do something else with my life. And I moved on to law school. Uh, I went back to D.C. where I'm from, Georgetown Law School. And the fortunate thing for me was while in law school, there was a big firm in D.C. at that time. It's no longer there called ProServe. And they represented a lot of athletes and a lot of tennis players. And I was just a kid like everyone else wanting to get into sports. But what I said is, hey, guys, I can come on as an unpaid intern and at least I can get you maybe meetings with some of the Stanford tennis players. I mean, that's something good, right? So they took a chance on me. I started working while in law school, mostly tennis doing whatever they asked. And then I got to the point where this might be instructive for those listeners who are in law school, where I got to the point where I said, okay, I got a chance here to either stay with 
sports, which every guy our age wants to do, or go to real law. And I had a chance to go to one of these real law firms and make a lot more money, be a little more secure, a lot more secure than the sports world. And I thought about it, you know, even all my friends were saying, you know, hang out with athletes versus hang out with stuffy lawyers, of course. But I really had a choice to make and I decided to stay in sports. So I really, at that point, 26 years old, kind of left behind being a quote unquote lawyer. I was more of a sports entrepreneur from that point forward, really. Pro serve, I was a tennis agent for a while. I got to a point where I'm like, I'm done with tennis. I, I'm done playing it, watching it, getting these kids their strings and their shoelaces. And I was able to move within the firm to a guy named David Falk, who was representing at that time Patrick Ewing and Michael Jordan and Alonzo Mourning and Allen Iverson, all these great basketball players. And he needed help. And that's a lesson to learn. When you see somewhere you can help, raise your hand. And, and I did, and I was able to move from tennis, same firm, to team sports. And so then what was your role? My role was, was role really with? doing whatever David wanted. I was obviously, I mean, I could sit here and say I was Michael Jordan's agent. Of course not. I was the guy who worked for Michael Jordan's agent. And drafting contracts, reviewing contracts, dealing with, in, in his case specifically, a lot of misappropriation where you'd see someone using Michael Jordan's image likeness, Air Jordan's image likeness without authorization. And I'd be the lawyer trying to get those pulled back, cease and desist, all those kind of things. Oh, you must've been busy and, with that then. <laughs> yeah, especially for like Michael. That kept me busy. But I also, he also let me have a lot, be the point person for a lot of basketball names. Not obviously as big as that, but for instance, you guys are too young, but way back in the day, this school in Baltimore, Dunbar, had four first round or four NBA players at the same time, same class, same team. And I represent a Muggsy Bogues, Reggie Lewis, who unfortunately nice. passed away, Reggie Williams and David Wingate. Uh, so those are some of the guys I work with. But the real key to my time at ProServe was I was able to establish a football division because David's passion and his strength, obviously, was NBA. So we had a few NFL guys and we developed it and I developed it. And it was great for me because we went from, you know, six NFL guys to one time I left 20. And so I had a football practice. It made my name in the football business um, to the point where, you know, I got known. I was doing a contract with the Minnesota Vikings. I'll never forget the guy who ran the Vikings was a guy named Mike Lynn, who also was running a new league. The NFL Europe was starting. And I remember that too. Yeah, it was so cool because then we we were he asked one day we were doing a negotiation and he kind of looks at me and says, "Do you speak Barcelona?" I said, "Is that Spanish?" He said, uh, "Yeah." It turned out it wasn't. Uh, so I said, "Yeah, I speak Spanish." And like I took it in high school, why not? And anyway, this led to him asking me to be the general manager of something called the Barcelona Dragons in the World League. I was young. I was single. I was like, you know, didn't really want to leave representing players, but here's an opportunity to run a team at a young age, albeit a minor league team overseas. I decided to do it. So, yeah, so you I, you'll see, Barcelona? Yes. I, so this wow. is the, I, you'll see this in my career a couple of times. I left the player side and went to the management side. I became the first general manager of the Barcelona Dragons. I had no coach, no players, no staff moving to a country that didn't know what football was, American football. So right away, what do I do? I have to hire a coach. I ask the NFL, who do I hire? They give me some names. Uh, you know, talk to this guy, this guy, Tony Dungy. Talk to this guy, this guy, Pete Carroll. <laughs> talk to no. this guy. Uh, That's and, amazing. and all those guys I talked to, and they were interested, but they're like, no way. I'm not, I'm not going to Spain. <laughs> so Well, I was going to ask, since it's both a new league and it's all the way in a different continent, I guess that's one of the hardest things is like talent acquisition early on, correct? Because you have to deal with that type of, you know, it's just total new and total difference all simultaneously at the same time. Yeah, there were two parts to this. One was the player and talent acquisition. And then, of course, dealing with the challenges overseas. Hired a coach. Those guys weren't interested. Boston College, BC had fired their coach, a guy named Jack McNell. I went up, I met him, I loved him. He said, all right. I said, you're in. He says, I got assistance. I said, they're hired. He said, I got trainers. I got video guys. I said, hired. That's all I wanted to know. 
Uh, then we go and get players. We draft them. We poke them. We prod them. We test them. We wonder lick them. We drug test them. We pick them. I don't know who to pick. I ask NFL people who to pick. I pick 80 players. We have a training camp for seven days in Florida. We cut to 40. I have to tell 40 guys they can't come to Spain with us, some of whom were Spanish. And then we go to Spain. And at that point, then we got to sell tickets. You know, we had sold like 200 tickets on a 40,000 seat stadium. And I'm trying to get tickets sold everywhere. I go to finally I go to the general manager of FC Barcelona, one of the great brands in all the world. And I, I'll, he allows us to go on the, his field at halftime to run around, kick the ball, throw the ball, have the announcer say, tomorrow night at Montjuic Stadium, Barcelona Dragons. And thank God it worked because we had, you know, we promised the NFL we'd get 15,000 people. We had 18,000 walk in that first night. And they were young and they didn't care about football and they wanted a party. So then I got to <laughs> worry about... I worry about the product. First half, no scoring. It was pretty squirrely. Second half, we get the ball. First drive, I hit the we hit the tight end. Seam pattern, three touchdown, three tackles. He breaks, touchdown. I'm jumping up and down, and the crowd is like this polite golf applause. No. <laughs> so I look around like, what is going on? Then the kicker comes on, kicks the extra point, and they go nuts. They go nuts. It's like the kicker. So we realize that this is different. Uh, you're selling a product they had no familiarity with. They hated the fact we had huddles. They called them meetings. Why do you have so, so many curious, meetings? What, what was, was you know, what that found out going like? I think I'm muted. Say it again, Josh. I'm muted. All right, maybe. No, I hear you. Yeah. Okay. You can hear me. Yeah. yeah so, so my, my question, question for you is, how does it differentiate from what's happening right now with London with the NFL? where I guess they're focusing more on brand, like what maybe did they learn from the European leagues that they're now applying with London? Was that more of an experiment for the NFL at the time? Like what was their objective with putting teams out there already trying to do at the time? I guess for more. Yeah, of I mean, what we had, we had kind of a, a dual mission over there, which I think was conflicting. I wish we just had one mission. On the one hand, we wanted to develop talent and we put a lot of guys in NFL training camps. Most of them didn't make it through training camp into the regular season. A few did, but we had a few. And then the other part of it was selling football around the globe. And you really try to make it different. You try to make it somewhere where, you know, fans can come and enjoy it. London and Germany were obviously much more sophisticated, advanced uh, audiences than Spain. It never got going in Spain to the point where they truly wanted American football. So London, we could tell even 20 years ago, London was the place where it was going to happen. And now, of course, the NFL has centralized its overseas expansion in London with not one, not two, but three stadium deals, uh, Wembley and Twickenham, which is a rugby stadium, and Tottenham, which is a new soccer stadium coming online in a couple of years. So London's really galvanized its efforts with the NFL, and we don't have the NFL Europe. My situation was I was there the first two years of the of the iteration of NFL Europe. It was called the World League, actually. Came back as NFL Europe suspended, came back again as NFL Europe folded. Uh, and now, of course, we're on to that. So after my time as GM of the Dragons, you know what I did? I went back to the player world. I started representing athletes again, this time for a group out of Boston called Bob Wolf Associates and uh, represent a lot of players up and down that area, BC players, things like that. And my time there was really dominated by a football player who I met as a baseball player in minor league system for the Phillies, a guy named Ricky Williams, who was a double A player during summers at University of Texas. And we got to know each other. I represent him on the baseball side. And then when it came time to be a football player, he asked me to represent him. Now, this was his junior season. Ricky Williams was one of the great football players in the country as a junior. We filled out the paperwork. He was going to go pro at the last <laughs> minute, we decided not to. So he was going to stay another year because he basically said, hey, Andrew, I want to be in Austin another year. Next year, they're going to kick me out of Austin, but I love Austin. So he stayed. And my million-dollar fee dropped to the ground and uh, <laughs> hung on for another year. And then it was a year of just sort of going down to UT, 
and protecting him every time and just being with him. And then he wins the Heisman Trophy, that whole thing. And I sign him. And for a couple months there, he's going to be a top pick and he's going around the world and I'm with him. And I'm just doing whatever I can to hang on. And eventually I see these guys hanging around him like, Ricky, what's up? He says, well, you know, these guys work for a guy named Master P. I said, who's Master P? (laughs) Really? He said he's a rapper. He's, you know, music impresario. I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, I want to work with Master P, starting a sports management firm. And I want you to work with Master P. And I'm like, me with P? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So this is something where, you know, everyone talks about life moments. I'm considering, not considering, I have to consider working with Master P because once Ricky Williams leaves the firm I'm with in Boston, I'm not going back there. So I'm really thinking that I'm going to be working with Master P. Now, at the exact same time this is happening, within hours, I'm getting these calls from the Green Bay Packers. Now, I had one client there. I had clients in the past, but at that time, one client who was a third string quarterback, one of my favorite people in the world that's actually still playing quarterback in the NFL named Matt Hasselback. Ah. But he didn't need a contract. So I finally called him back. I said, listen, I can't deal with Hasselback. I got Ricky Williams. I got Master P. I, I can't. And they say, listen, we're not calling about Hasselback. I said, why are you calling me? I said, well, Mike Holmgren, our coach, just went to the Green, I'm sorry, just went to the Seattle Seahawks. And I said, okay. And they said, well, he took Reinfeld. Reinfeld was the guy that ran the whole business operation with the Packers, and Holmgren took him. And I said, okay. And they said, well, how'd you like to switch sides? And I said, come to Green Bay? I said, you deal with like 100 agents. Why, why me? And they said, well, you seem to have a nice way. We want to get more agent friendly. What better way than to hire an agent? You know your way around the cap and contracts. We we like the way you deal with people, all those kind of things. And I said, all right, great. I'll come talk to you. So I divert from Austin, Texas to Green Bay, Wisconsin. First time I ever (laughs) went there. And like the conversation I mentioned earlier, I just was very frank and went back, talked to my wife, at this point now a wife from Villanova, PA, and one son, baby. And uh, we decided to make the move. I just tried to sort of get off the train of chasing players around all the time because being an agent is all about recruiting and uh, uh, catering to every need. And then the team side was something a little more stable, a little more management oriented. So we moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I was there nine and a half years. Um, I think quickly to what to say about my role there is that Everyone knows what a scout is. Everyone knows what a coach is. What I was was kind of this vice president of football administration. I handled all the player contracts. I did the cap. I dealt with the league on all player issues, grievances, labor issues, fines, drug issues. Uh, And I was kind of the balance point between the business side of the organization, which is very long term. How are we looking in five years? What if there's no cap? What if this new collective bargaining agreement has different terms? On the one hand, and then on the other side, I would look at what about the football side? And they're very immediate. You know, can we get this player signed today, tomorrow? What's going on? So at some points, I was the voice of caution to the football side saying, hey, wait, we can do this next year. Just chill. And some points, the voice of aggression to the business side saying we need to do this now. Uh so basically, you know, to, to finish my time there, I was there nine and a half years. We got, you know, one thing we noticed right away was just how much the community wraps itself around the team, which for a few years was something I loved. But at the end, it just felt like it was too much where me, my wife, my kids, we really couldn't go out anywhere and not talk about the Packers. Um that became the wall started closing in. I felt like, like this is just too insular where it's just Packers. And I, and we sort of felt like we got to get out of here. At what point did that start happening? Like how long were you guys in green? Well, we were there a total of nine years. I just started maybe feeling this the last couple of years uh, and talked to a lot of people who had similar situations where they were there, you know, a period of time, five, six, seven, eight years and felt like, okay, that, you know, that was enough. What's the craziest 
way that someone's ever tried to get information out of you or like what's been the most inappropriate situation that you've been in where people were like, I need to know. <laughs> I feel like it would be fantasy. For, fantasy. Yeah, I mean, just this little day to day things, I'd be, you know, pumping gas at the at the pump and some guy tapped me on his shoulder. And, you know, how's that? How's that Donald Driver contract going? You know, something like that. Or um, just everything with Brett. Uh, and Aaron and the divorce that went on then and just trying to get information. It was tough sometimes to even be social because you don't want to let out any, any kind of confidential information. I'm actually, I'm very curious. Like Green Bay, the whole city is investing in that team, right? I don't think there's any other team, in, especially in the country, as it's up with the Packers. You know, they're publicly owned. Like fans can technically own the team. So I guess, is, have you heard comparable situations like colleagues and other like, hardcore sports towns or is Green Bay just by the environment of what it is a truly different dynamic than any other franchise out there? Yeah, as I mentioned, I grew up in D.C. The Redskins were huge. They galvanized the city in a city that never gets along about anything. And then living in Philly, you see the passion that there is about sports teams. But in all those cities, there are many, right? Here there's Flyers, Eagles, Sixers, there's Villanova, there's all this stuff, Temple football. And of course, DC has so much going on, and everywhere you go, but but Green Bay, that's it, you know. So that's it. That is True. the focus. Um, and again, I wasn't the coach, I wasn't the GM, I wasn't even the president, but I was known as the guy to talk about that kind of stuff. And I think everyone sort of feels like you know, my wife and I are mid are not Midwesterners, and we love the people there. But at some point you realize, hey, you're a little different. You know, we I didn't hunt. I didn't ice fish. It's totally different out there. I didn't snowmobile. Yeah. I didn't grow up in that kind of weather. Um, so again, there's a little differing views on that. So really 1990, I'm sorry, 2009, we left. Uh, and, you know, after moving my wife to rural Wisconsin for nine years, she got to pick the next stop. Um, <laughs> So we ended up back in Philadelphia. And what I really wanted to do, I looked at that as kind of a halftime of my career where I could change the direction. Um, I've had a lot of offers to go back to teams. I've had a lot of offers to go back to agency. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna try something different. So a few things, number one, uh, on the writing side, when I went graduated Stanford 20 something years ago, my my journalism professors would all say, hey, you're just a gifted writer. You should really pursue that. Of course, I never did. So here was an opportunity to do it. I started a website called National Football Post, started writing about inside football with some other guys, Mike Lombardi, who was on NFL Networks, now with the Patriots, uh, with a former players, with agents. We created this website about inside. Look, no one was doing that. Uh, and we did that. And I wrote for that. It's still going. I wrote for it for a few years. On the teaching side, Wharton got in touch with me right away. They knew I was from back here, or my wife was, and asked me to start teaching. And I said, sure, I'll teach a sports business class, but I'm you know, going to do a lot of other things. And they were fine with that, obviously. Um, so then what's grown in the past six years is that from writing my own website, I started getting known as someone that could really break down complex topics on sports law, sports business, sports policy, and hit kind of a key point in 2010, 11, where networks saw what was ahead on the landscape, lockouts, contract problems, labor problems, not only NFL, but NBA, Major League Baseball, hockey, basketball. And luckily for me, I had an opportunity to join a couple networks, I chose ESPN in uh, January of 2011. And so I now am in my sixth year. Uh, they're really, again, like I said, sort of breaking down. That year was really mainly the lockout, if you remember that, in 2011. But since then, concussions, domestic violence, gambling, you name it. Everything's sort of outside the game. Right. On the, on the writing side, I was doing my own writing. Then ESPN said, do you do your writing for us? So I had to give up writing for my own site, but I maintain equity. And then two years ago, Sports Illustrated started a football-centric website. Peter King, who I think is kind of the lead voice.
voice in football media and asked me to join the band and be one of the writers and write about my expertise on the business of football. So on the writing side, I've been doing that. So I'm, I've been able to, luckily, I'm very fortunate, continue to do TV and radio for ESPN and do my writing for Sports Illustrated. How? And that's the media side. How long were you doing the, the your first website? How long until you felt like people started to catch on and you became like a thought leader in that area of, of the NFL and of sports? Yeah, it's interesting, Eddie, because I, I, I sat down the night before we started publishing our first articles and we looked at each other and says, what if no one reads this stuff? <laughs> what if no one reads it? What do we do? So you stopped everything else and you focus, you guys focused on just doing that, right? We did. I mean, I was teaching uh, and I was doing some speaking and, and still wondering whether this was going to be everything. But once it got going, how I was exciting. right. Yeah, how exciting was that? Yeah, then I saw the first article. I'm like looking at our analytics and like, wow, 150 people are care about this. And then, so I'm curious, was your original marketing all just using your own personal brands at that point? Were you yes. guys like tweeting about it, Facebooking, things of that nature? I know we're talking 2009 when I didn't, we didn't have Twitter. I mean, we had Twitter. I didn't have Twitter. You didn't use Twitter. No, but it wasn't was. peak Twitter yet. It wasn't but today's it Twitter. That, I got to it like six months in, like I guess it was mid-2009, late-2009. Um, and that's what I found Twitter was. Okay, here's a way to put out these articles. And you started like tweeting about just – basically, you became like a, a, a go-to source for like news in the, in the league. And like guys during the lockout were like looking for towards you to see like what's happening with the – negotiations and whether or not they're yeah, going to be practicing. No, that, was, that was now a year and a half, two years later. I'd say for a year, my social media was all about just putting out an article. I mean, that, and I was writing three, four columns a week. Okay. Which now I look back and I struggle to put together my one column a week. <laughs> I was really proud. Uh, but I would, you know, it would be financial Fridays, three things going on in the NFL. And it was really something where, I became a writer uh, and then I was teaching class, but I did want to expand the media to really what I saw was kind of a real void in the media where you have thousands of media writing about games or coaches or players or who's going to win or who's a better team or the games itself. And I said, no one's doing this. And some people were trying to do it, but they didn't have a background to have perspective and informed opinion about you it. You had the clout, the background, the connections, the personal yeah. brand to go with it, all those assets. And so the other problem, Josh, was that when I would talk to people recently left the NFL, whether they were fired or whatever, and I'd say, why don't you write? They'd say, well, yeah, but what they were writing was just milk toast, you know, because well, I was going to say, one of the things I think you do exceptionally well. And almost anyone in your audience and other fall leaders is you communicate like plain English for the everyday fan, the everyday individual to understand. Because what you're talking about is incredibly complex, sophisticated subjects. And especially if you're just a semi fan of the sport or a team, a casual fan, you're not going to know all the intricate details like what goes in the caps, labor dis 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 negotiations, those type of discussions, which I think you've done an exceptionally well job of communicating that so anyone can understand. And I think that's probably another aspect of why you scaled so quickly was because you could be a source that people could communicate or at least understand what. Yeah. I mean, I really appreciate that because I think that's a talent that people should learn when you can take a complex subject and break it down in understandable. It doesn't have to be elementary, but just in bites, digestible bites, I call them that people can look at and take away. And the other thing is if you're going to be in media, whether it's print, uh, digital or TV or radio, you've got to be authentic. I mean, that's really worked for me because if I was doing this as a resume to get back in the NFL or to work for players, I wouldn't be successful. I see people do that. I was just talking about that where people wanted to write for me and they were just using it as a resume to get back in the NFL. It's not going to work. <clears throat> Audiences are too smart. Totally. Uh, when, you, when you just read a something and you go, this guy, he's not saying anything. Yeah. He won't say anything. He's trying to get a job. Uh, so listen, I get asked all the time, do you want to go back for a team? Do you want, and I've consulted for the Eagles. I told them I'm not going to work for you, but I'll consult for you. When you need something you want me to look into, I'll do that. But I'm not going to do it because I've committed to this 
life of media and academia, and um, it's really been great. So did you? So I guess it's. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, you did you you gave up writing? Well, you didn't give up, but you you kind of were forced to to give up writing for your website when you started working for ESPN, right? Were you doing the same thing there? Was it the same kind of environment? Like, were they giving you all the freedom that you had on your website? Yeah, that's been great. I mean, ESPN and Sports Illustrated the past few years, I think out of hundreds of columns, maybe two or three times, they said, why don't you write about this? Otherwise, they trust me to know what to write about. Yeah, they. Ch I mean, yeah. they, they picked you, so I, I assume they just kind of wanted you to, to run it and do your own thing. Yeah, and I think the you know the thing you mentioned about giving up writing for my site, ESPN at that time, this was 2012, 13, they were fine with me continuing to write for my small website. My website partners, and you guys can probably understand this, were not fine with that. Right. They were like, hey, you're either with us or you're with ESPN. So it was interesting. It was the big company was not worried at all about me writing for my original site, but I had to make a choice with my own partners. And then I decided that I would rather uh, write for ESPN, maintain my equity, and my brand would still be out there if people wanted to find it. Now, is there any overlap between ESPN and your old website? I mean, there, do you guys syndicate any of those articles? No, I mean, what they're, they're still operating, but a lot of us have, from the beginning, have left, and okay. it's been a great springboard for a lot of people. That's um, cool. Yeah, and that, I think that's what it's about, you know, and hopefully one so keep, that, that does have some, some exit. So keeping with the topic of media, this is something, the first time I met you, we briefly talked about it, but I'm very curious from your perspective, and I realize it's more opinionated with live streaming, with the way social media has taken over sports of fantasy. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts, like 10, 15, 20 years as the media keeps evolving and more internet-connected devices and, you know, having these amazing smartphones and wearable where do you think sports is going, like, especially from your role in the media and then just delivering the product, delivering the content to the everyday fan, um, the brand, everything that kind of falls into that? Yeah, well, I think before getting to the, the, the sort of tech aspect of it, I think where sports journalism is going is hopefully people like me can continue to evolve where you, you, you have to be unique and you have to be kind of a first mover. You can't just be like everyone else because the market won't stand for it. You know, you, there can't be a hundred guys that fall in line behind one opinion. They've got to be different. And people want unique, people want access. And you know, I get a lot of nice response in media and especially on Twitter when I can take them inside the room. You know, this is what really is going on. Or my translations, you know, when people say- so It's almost like a personal narrative has been an asset you found, like before the media is going. What, I'm sorry, what has been what? So almost like giving your own personal narrative, your own perspective of what's going on. You found that to be probably the best way currently leveraging what technology gives you and what you're using to be yeah. kind of your biggest asset. Yes, and I, I think sort of taking you inside the room, what's happening in there, what are people really thinking, what goes on behind the scenes that people don't know, I think a lot of media just sort of thinks it goes a certain way and then it really doesn't. Uh, but I think on the tech side, you're right. It's the wearables. You know, there's articles this week about how the Super Bowl is going to look in 100 years. And I think what we're going to see is that especially stadia are going to be much more retractable. So we have retractable roofs right now, you know, like domes when they want it to be or non-domes. But we're going to have stadiums that can go from 20,000 to 40,000 to 60,000 to 100,000. And you can work out so many different types of events and concerts. And I covered, as you might know, this NFL to L.A. move over the past mm -hmm. few months. And they, they're going to this what I call Shangri-La that's going to be built in L.A. And it's going to be that type of thing. It's You can't rely. What I learned in Green Bay when we renovated Lambeau Field, you can't rely on a building for 10, 12, 15 days a year. It's just not happening anymore. So these buildings are going to be 150, 200 days a year. The NFL version of it in L.A. is going to have game, uh, you know, Rams games, maybe a second team's games. They're going to have soccer games. They're going to have Olympics. They're going to have World Cup. 
They're going to have concerts. They're going to have the Pro Bowl. They're going to have the Super Bowl. They're going to have Combine. They're going to have NFL entertainment events. So this is where it's going. You can't fund these big apparatus anymore without having multiple dates, like hundreds of dates, not tens of them, hundreds. That's going to be changing. And then you mentioned hey, wearables. I mean, we're going to see so many angles. You're going to be at your seat seeing whatever angle you want, virtual reality of what the, the quarterback is seeing. I just think all that's coming. That's exciting, the, especially because VR is becoming so prominent in the tech scene. And like, I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be such a, it's going to grow and, 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 and become so, you know, so much better that to be able to experience a sporting event in that way from the, from the QB's perspective, to see what he sees would be insane. And one thing I really hope, like, I, I don't know if this is realistic, but I've always wanted this, uh, is like every player to be mic'd and to be able to experience the chatter and the banter that goes on on the field. Because I feel like that's something, if you sit, if you've ever sat courtside, which you, I'm sure you have, I mean, you get to hear that, you get to be part of that like atmosphere. That's crazy to me. And I would, I would pay stupid amounts of money to just be that involved in a, in a sporting event. Well, I think you also play with the VR factor. You technically don't have to be in the stadium anymore, right? Part of it is technically you could pay for a seat in virtual reality where you're talking about a stadium that holds 100,000 people, you could have 18 million viewers watching on CBS and there are 10 million viewing as if they're at the stadium for that type of broadcast, right? Like that authentic VR. Like, and that can relate to any sports. But it also kind of brings a question to me where it's not so much necessarily, I think, with our generation, but I hear a lot more of like my parents, my parents' parents, which is why do you go to a game anymore when it's more cost-effective to watch on TV? You get a better presentation, higher definition, you have the broadcasters and it's curious to see like now that you can watch the game on any device live stream. I mean, it's only a matter of time till I'm watching NFL highlights on my watch, right? I'm yeah. sure there's an app already I haven't downloaded. Like how do leagues combat that or embrace it? Cause I think you're kind of seeing like Periscope and Meerkat came out last year and almost every league immediately was like, I'm not touching that. Right. You know, ban it, get rid of it. Like none of them embraced it, but at the same time, it's an opportunity for them to market right. a funnel. So understanding like, how technology moves so much quicker than even people can adopt. How can, you know, how are leagues going to embrace and where is it going to be fought back? And kind of, I guess, more your opinion than anything else, like where you foresee that type of distribution and broadcasting, things like that going in the long term because of it. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just covering last night that the NFL did a new deal for Thursday night football. It used to be just CBS. Now they've added NBC and CBS and the NFL Network, of course. And it's just diabolical by them because not only do they get football on Thursday nights, but they cut into CBS's and NBC's entertainment programming and replace it with NFL. It's just diabolical. It's, it's such a great <laughs> negotiating tactic. But they've saved, they're not done yet on Thursday night. They have saved another level of negotiations and that's OTT. So over the top streaming, they are gonna sell to I think probably a Yahoo or, or a Google or a Apple or Netflix. So that deal is yet to come. Now that's just Thursday nights. We don't know what's gonna happen with Sundays and Mondays and, and, and the like. So that's one area we're gonna see these leagues use these as revenue opportunities for streaming, for mobile, for handhelds. Everything's gonna be changing in terms of rights fees you know, where CBS and NBC are paying these hundreds of millions of dollars, that's not going to get them that. That's not going to get them that. They got, that's a separate negotiation. The other thing is the game day experience. I know the NFL in my, what I cover most the NFL, they're very concerned about it. You know, what they've done in the past couple of years is obviously the wireless capabilities. I went to a couple of stadiums a couple of years ago and had problems at all three stadiums where I went to the same ones this year and I could hook up you know, including Lincoln Financial, we're fine, no problems whatsoever. And that's going to continue beyond just getting a wireless signal. All, all these upgrades have to happen. You know, as far as the game day experience, yeah, I'm going to the Super Bowl all week later on tonight, but I'll be back to watch with my boy, my sons on the big screen at home. Now, is it going to be better to be at the game because it's such an event? Maybe, but you know, it's hard for fans to understand that there's a lot going on at the game, but especially with weather issues, 
people like being at home and other comforts of it. That's a challenge. That is a challenge. Get people in the stadium. And some of these bells and whistles are going to have to happen to get them there, especially the younger generations. How many? Uh, so, how many? Uh, you can do it. Just wanted to know how many Super Bowls you've been to. Yeah, I, you know, I've been to as a fan of the Redskins. And uh, back when Marcus Allen, you know, buried us with this run, that <laughs> I was crying for days. Uh, although I saw them one, win one, too, with Doug Williams and uh, beating the Broncos. Then with the Packers, we never went. We got to a couple of championship games while I was there. So I went to a couple with the Packers. And then one year when we got to the championship and didn't get in, I said, that's it. Unless we're in, I'm not going. And then when the Packers did go after I had left the Packers, my boys were fans. We went, this was a couple years ago in Dallas when they beat the Steelers uh, in 2011 to win. But since, you know, again, it's, I don't want to sound spoiled, but it's kind of been there, done that. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm spoiled. <laughs> so one of my big questions for you is, with everything you've done, um, every thing while well, Eddie fixes echo real quick, with everything you've been doing through your career, from the player side to the personnel side to the actual franchise, you know, the media, do you have, like, I guess there's a two-folded question for you, which is, number one, what is it that you kind of want your legacy to be, right? When it's all said and done, when you've done everything in your whole career, what is it that you want people to most finally look back at you on? And second of that, which can go hand in hand, but it's not necessarily mutually exclusive. What to you is the definition of success? Because I'm very curious to see how those things are connected and how they also separate simultaneously from, especially in the industry that you're in and all the different things you. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I hear so many players get asked about legacy. <laughs> it's really, it's really something you kind of, hard to answer in the moment and maybe good to answer when you're on that rocking chair at 85 years old. But um, I think for each different one, for being a player agent, I want to feel like I was a guy who really told players what they needed to hear rather than what they wanted to hear. I think too many agents are enablers and they're worried about being fired. I get it. But they tell players just what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear, especially about money management especially about controlling finances and living for the future. And I always told players, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. And always look at football, basketball, baseball, hockey as a, not a career, but a start of a career. So you're going out into the world with your college mates that are already four, five, six, eight years into their working career. You use this as a springboard, you're gonna be behind them, but you've gotta use that. On the team side, I look at my legacy with the Packers as creating an opportunity for them to be successful long term. It was always important to me to not, for instance, renegotiate Brett Favre's contract over and over again. So you build up all this what's called dead money cap charge. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, so we would protect it. So whether it's Aaron Rodgers or whatever, we could build a team that could be successful a long time after losing a franchise Hall of Famer like Brett Favre. So with the Packers, it was all about, I felt like at the Packers, for the reasons you talked about with public uh, ownership, that I was part of, I was representing a public trust and everything I did was kind of with the shareholders, the cheese heads in mind and looking towards the future and protecting them. And maybe I'm most proud of, about what I'm still doing and hopefully getting better at is in this new role of media and academia, being a unique voice that generations behind me can now look to and say, okay, that's a different way to cover the media, to cover football, to cover sports. That's a different look at the way I looked at sports, both in my writing, in my broadcasting, in my radio, and in my teaching, where I can be a, I, I, um, an early adapter, I guess, in a way of covering talking about sports business, sports law, sports policy, sports thought, sports social change in a way that affects many beyond me. That's what I hope my legacy is. That's awesome. And, you know, follow question to all that. What is your day-to-day -day life 
like now an average day? Like, what is your routine? What are you doing? What are some habits you form that you find maybe more makes you more optimized or more productive or more in the moment that maybe people listening or going to listen could actually use their own lives? Like maybe you've picked up over your career. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I know a lot of people out there talk about their day is different every day. Mine is truly different every day because some days I'm more TV, some more writing, some more radio, some more uh, dealing with teaching. And I not only teach at Villanova Law School, I run a program there at the Morad Center for Sports Law. I'm the executive director. Sometimes that will take my time. I think, the you know, I look at each week and how much of the week is going to be media, how much is going to be academia, what are my ESPN commitments. Sometimes I know them in advance. Sometimes I know them not by 9, 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the, in the morning for afternoon or evening programming, which disrupts the whole day. But this is what you have when you're managing three, four, five jobs, and I'm fine with that. I can live with that. Some people can't. Uh, I would say I'm busier now without a real job <laughs> than I was <laughs> when I had a real job. I've got four or five jobs and uh, they all keep me busy and happy. I mean, the one thing in terms of setting my day, I try to do first thing early in the morning when it's dark out, I punch up this computer and I start my writing because I want to get that out of the way first. I write a column every week for uh, Sports Illustrated and I'll craft that column through the week. Usually a lot of that work is done first thing in the morning and, and weekend mornings when the kids are asleep. That's a good time for me because once the day gets going, you don't get that block of time to sit and actually write. And I not only write for my column, but I'm writing thoughts for at some day I'm going to put a book together. I know I have a lot of people asking me, when is that book coming? But at some day I'm going to have these thoughts all coalesced into a book. And then later in the day, what's important to me, and I reflect this on Twitter as well, is fitness. Uh, I work in, work out, work in a workout every day, whether that's cardio with running or biking or spinning or some kind of uh, exercise inside when it's like this out or the, the weights or some kind of. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I wanted to ask you how you how you stay focused and efficient. Like, I guess doing your writing in the morning is smart because you don't get that rush of texts and emails and phone calls. So, but like throughout the day, how do you stay on, on task and like what what do you do to, to kind of block out the noise? Yeah, I mean, I try to, I move, uh, not only workout move, but I actually move locations. I have an office at Villanova. I have an office at home where I am now. Uh, I'll go do radio on, from the car when I'm going place to place. Um, I think that's important to sort of break up your day in different points. Uh, I think it's important to schedule in kid time, whether it's it, going to see a son play soccer or basketball, whether it's after dinner helping with homework. So you just you sort of have it in your day that these blocks are going to be available. How much sleep are you getting at night? <laughs> Uh, you know, I get up early, but if I can, you know, get to bed between 10 and 11, I'm good. Sometimes it's between 11 and 12, Right. but I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. And again, fitness is a big part of that. Yeah. Uh, as long as I can get that in, I feel better about sleep and, and eating. And I do a lot of my reading. You know, I got to keep up with everything. I do a lot of reading. Like I'll, I'll eat lunch by myself and I'll catch up on a lot of reading. You need so one. One of, one of the questions I was going to ask is, since fitness is a huge aspect, a lot of people I meet who are really into fitness too also are really into the nutrition side. So do you also follow that to a T? Do you like plan meals or know what you're going to eat or find certain meals that can make you more effective or you just feel more focused or have like that type of routine as well? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a green tea junkie. It's in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> So first thing in the morning and probably through about noon, uh, drinking a lot of green tea. Um, I do my smoothie after working out with a lot of protein powder and fruits and sometimes greens in there as well. Um, I'm not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian, but I eat, you know, red meat I'll eat once a year, maybe once or twice a year. Uh, a lot of fish, a lot of vegetables, uh, a lot of fruits. Uh, I eat a lot of yogurt. Um, 
you know, I try not to be obsessive about it with nutrition and food because I know people are like that. and They're all over the top. To mm -hmm. me. I just kind of do my own thing. And uh, it sounds like you just keep it like bare essentials, but whatever that bare essential is, you're cool if it's like mindset. Yeah. And I think, you know, listen, I've always, it's since a, a young age, um, I just have always admired people that put kind of physical and mental fitness first. Uh, because it's kind of like when I write first thing in the morning, writing can be one of the hardest things to do for the day. I think it's always important to get that out of the way. You know, do your hardest things first, because then you can focus. Like if you have a project at work and there's something that's kind of on your mind, you know, procrastination will only lead to stress. So if there's that thing on your desk that you've just been avoiding, you got to get it out of the way because I've, I've been there. You know, it just or a call, an uncomfortable call is tough. Um, and I've been there where you keep postponing that. That's just going to build stress. Yeah, so try worse. to get that out of the way. The longer you wait. So are there any exciting projects in the future for you that you haven't really started yet or that you, you haven't really told anyone about yet that you like want to share or, or want us <laughs> to know about? Because I'm, I'm interested <laughs> to know you. You've got like, you know, moving from, you know, your your legal job into the, the website into working with ESPN and and all that's so, such an exciting progression I'm, I'm excited to know what's next for for Andrew Brandt <laughs> well a lot of what's next is what is the, is already there in terms of uh, continue my column weekly Thursday mornings on the mmqb.com uh, ESPN you know once now that we're in the off season unlike a lot of people at ESPN they're busier during the season and now we get to the off season, at least after Sunday, um, I get real busy. And uh, there's a show called in the afternoon on ESPN called NFL Insiders, which I'm not used during the season, but I'm going to be used in the off season. So just, you know, mark your calendar starting uh, February 15th and 16th. I'll be on that show as well. It's on from two. We'll plug in the show notes for you. Awesome. We got you. 2.30 to 3.30 <laughs> every, uh, every afternoon. Awesome. Um, and then some some projects, you know, I just mentioned it to you. The book project is always something I think about. Uh, the one thing with the book is what I never wanted to do was kind of do a kiss and tell. You know, right after I left the Packers, I had book publishers saying, you know, what really went on with Brett Favre? I, I just don't want to be that person. But it would be it would more be like what we talk about, taking you inside a lot of different areas of my life. And that's something I'm talking to a couple publishers. I, I thought well, you were telling us about the Barcelona days. That's not a like, really interesting, like compelling storytelling. If you could incorporate that into the book, that would be great. I would. I was interested in, in hearing the details about those days. Yeah, that was a unique experience. Like I said, they cheered at the wrong times, and they did the the wave the entire game long. And, uh, <laughs> the <old> song <laughs> the entire game long. <laughs> You know, these are great so, experiences, but I, like you said, I want to keep creating new ones. So one of the biggest questions I have for you before if anyone on the chat wants to leave a question, this will become your time. Um, you've made such severe career jumps, even though they're kind of like similar verticals. Yeah. You've gone from one career direction and changed it. And most of the people listening to our show are entrepreneurs or they're in the corporate world or business world or inspiring to do something creative, entrepreneurial, whatever it might be. And you've taken multiple leaps, which I think for a lot of people, they'll never do. So look at the risk and they'll say, hell no, right? That's you know not going to be worth it or why am I going to ruin a good thing? So my question for you, and perhaps maybe you can even expand upon is, like, what goes in your head when you made these decisions? And what would you tell such people who are like bouncing those type of you know major decisions when it comes to the career or livelihood or family? Um, especially because you mentioned even later on now, yet family is another just huge part of this equation. And, you know, how did you go about it? Like, what's your mental process that maybe other people can adopt on their own when it comes to this type of stuff? Yeah, I think to lead a life like mine now in the past six years, you got to have a lot of self-reliance, self-motivation, self-discipline. Um, and I don't think some people don't. Sometimes it's easier, like I said, to sort of have a real job where you go in every day, you're there eight, eight, eight 10, 12 hours, and it's kind of there for you. You, you figure it out while you're there rather than schedule your own time. Um, I always looked at it as, I think here's a, here's a weakness of mine. I can be easily bored. So I always look for moves that are exciting to me, 
that make me feel good about where I am and I see as a possibility of doing for a while and if I get bored I can transition somewhere else you know the one thing that was important to me is living life on my terms um, yes I have bosses there are bosses in all these areas I do but they all understand I'm not a nine to five person with them so it's again living more and more on my terms a lot of people don't really do that until they're 60 something years old and I wanted to sort of do that ramp that up earlier I think you just have to be comfortable with that kind of life you know again like a lot of entrepreneurs watching this know what you guys know is that you know you get some looks when you're out when I'm you know when I'm exercising at 1030 with the housewives you know that <laughs> but I'm completely comfortable with that. I've been there. And, and some people aren't, you know, and, and so you have to have that mentality. And I think the other thing is that you've got to sort of get past um, stereotypical norms of workplace. And I think the, the nature of entrepreneurs get that. Do you think you'll ever be uh, satisfied with the content and the uh, value you're giving to your audience and the, and the world really do you think you'll ever feel that or, or do you think it's kind of like something you're always chasing always chasing you know I feel that way um, I just feel like there's a lot more you know scratching the surface I can get to a lot more with that and, well, I think uh, I think that's important that's an important feeling and it keeps you young and it keeps you motivated yeah I mean uh, listen there have been a couple of times, and I'd, ra I'd rather not get into it, but as I kind of mentioned earlier, where people have asked me to, you know, drop all this and come to work with them for, you know, very impressive offers. And I start thinking down that road, and it just, my experience is, and again, this is recent. This is not 20 years ago, 10 years ago. This is five in the past few years, where once I start thinking down that road, you know, the good stuff comes down, the money, the security, the, and then I start, then I get this really knot in my stomach. You know, both times it's happened with this big job offer where I've gotten this knot where I've said, oh no, I don't want that. You know, I don't, I don't want to have that responsibility. What do you feel like you'd be giving up? I mean, other than the freedom to live life on your own terms. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And I guess what I feel is that maybe what I felt at the Packers that really kind of hastened my exit there, which is kind of like, you're always on. You're just always on. And as an agent, you're always on. Now, here I am in media, and you got to always know what's going on. And I get calls at 11 o'clock, hey, this just happened. Can you comment on that? But that's to me, is more palatable than this is happening. We got to work on this, you know, at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, whatever it is, you just always have that on button, I think, in some of the job roles that I've been involved with. And if I can't, if I can stay away from that, I will. All right. And last question, Andrew, because this seriously, man, this is so much fun and truly all of us. We really do appreciate you having on the show, man. So last, last question. A lot more lightweight in his last question is, what's your prediction for Sunday for Super Bowl 50? <laughs> Let's hear your prediction. Yeah. I keep telling you, I'm not that guy. I'm the business guy. <laughs> oh, I'm totally. I can, well, you know how to ask that question. Man. I can play that guy and do like <laughs> real um, I'm going to hedge here. Listen, I, I think that this Denver defense is truly special where um, – we all can talk about Peyton Manning's shortcomings this year and whether he's going to retire. I, you know, beyond all that, I think they are truly a defense that can win without, ex without what is it, exceptional offensive play. <laughs> Does that mean I'm picking them? Uh, <laughs> if if they can hang with Carolina early, because Seattle and um, Arizona could not. You know, the Seattle was 31 nothing by halftime, and Arizona was a runaway early. They can just stay with them into the half. Then I'm, I'm going to pick an upset. I just think this Denver defense, Carolina defense is great too, 
But this Denver defense has such an ability to change a game that they don't need Peyton Manning to be the old Peyton Manning on Sunday. And so I guess I'm going to pick an upset. That's awesome, man. You know, we're going to air this on the podcast in the morning. So some people are going to hear this that morning of, that day. Some people on their Monday commute. So we'll see what, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, in picture, but. Totally wrong. <laughs> so, all right, last thing for you is how can people reach you, follow what you're doing, the articles you're sharing? I know you plugged the show earlier, but, you know, what's the best way for people to kind of find you? Well, again, there's the different ways. The, the main way is, of course, Twitter. Um, and again, I try to make Twitter these nuggets of information that people otherwise wouldn't get. And uh, it's my name, Andrew Brandt. Um, it used to be A.D. Brandt, but then I, was, I had a guy tell me you know, he could get me Andrew Brandt. And I trusted him. He got it. I, I remember um, seeing both. Do you, ever, do you have any novelty accounts or, um, or uh, imposter accounts? No, I haven't reached that phase yet. No. That's not, <laughs> I don't have that. And not that I know of. Uh, so Twitter, one. of course. Um, and then on the writing side, the MMQB.com. It's headlined by Peter King, who, of course, has millions and millions of followers. Uh, I'm kind of in that level below Peter. Uh, but Thursday morning is usually when my column comes out. Uh, and then on the TV, on the radio side, I tweet out a lot of my radio appearances. On the TV side, whatever's coming up, Super Bowl Sunday, I'll be on lines on ESPN at 9 a.m. Eastern talking about the state of the NFL. Awesome. Uh, and again, I mentioned a couple afternoon on ESPN appearances on February 15th and 16th. And of course, I'll tweet out all those appearances going forward. Awesome. So what I'll do is I'll include all of that in the show notes, too. It'll be on iTunes, SoundCloud, um, YouTube. But seriously, Andrew, this was so much fun, man. We'll have to do it again in a couple seasons when you start writing your book, when um, you've basically taken over all of the NFL media. But again, we'll put it on the show notes. Everyone's got to tweet Andrew. Special thank you for being on the show. And um, seriously, man, enjoy. You know, safe travels to the Super Bowl this week. Enjoy the game Sunday with your son. And again, thank you, man. You got it, guys. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, man. Take, Take care. care. You got it.